brands or people generally think influencer marketing is like they treat influencer marketing the way they treat facebook ads the main currency of influencer marketing is trust and authenticity right you cannot treat it the way you run meta ads that's not what it is it's human to human connection this requires you building relationships with influencers it requires bringing influencers in to really understand what your brand is about speaking more about influencers they come in all shapes and sizes how can brands cut through the you know noise and find the right influencer to partner with right. so one you need to know what your brand is about two you need to have an objective then that can give you guideposts for you to then go out and say okay these are the kind of influencers that align with our brand these are the kind of influencers that can help us achieve what we want to achieve nike launching air jordan specifically uh, my, for a player right yes it was yes. sort of influencer marketing back then <laughs> yeah like yeah those potential don't... in michael jordan Exactly. Those are the first influencers, you know. It's and again, that's why influence marketing is not entirely new. What what is new is the social media aspect of it. Looking at popular top voices in the market to let you know leveraging top voices in any industry is not yeah. entirely new. It's the social media and good digitalization of it that is relatively new. Yeah. Right. So it's that's, it's. That's a good point. Welcome everyone to season 2 of Impulse the influencer marketing podcast I am your host Shubham Tiwari head of content and uh, social set philo the universal api for creator data our guest today has over a decade of experience in marketing and the creator economy he has collaborated with over 1500 creators on 200 more than 200 projects reaching over 200 million social social media users generating 3 billion views and of course partnering partnering with top brands more than 50 brands leading uh, their previous company to win influencer marketing agency of the year and authoring a valuable influencer compensation report he is none other than benga sogbai ke benga welcome to the show thank you very much shubham nice to be here please tell us about uh, the compensation report that you created uh, influencer okay. compensation report what does it consist yeah, yeah. um So the compensation report essentially was to um, we created it to help influencers and brands um, have a better sense or idea of um, of you know compensation in the market, how much influencers get paid for the different kinds of content they create, um, right. depending on the duration, the niche, and all that. So it's just to give everybody a better sense of how much of what compensation looks like in the market. Um, and then we did it for I think for two years. uh consecutively but now we've not done it for a, for a couple of um, months now but uh, I, i believe a new a new edition of that should come out you know maybe this right. year next year and and where can our listeners and viewers access this report um i can share that with you um after the super after after this uh, show um we yep. we used to have it on a on a specific url but for now it's been rested and we are trying to uh, we jig some things behind the scenes so as soon as the new url is web is available we'll to let you know right so we'll uh, definitely put the link in the description of this video anyone who is interested to know uh, any kind of help you want uh, that report will be really helpful when you know coming uh, to you know some of the biggest misconceptions brands have about influencers yeah. and influencer yeah. marketing these days because yeah. it's a very newer form of marketing a new channel yeah. so please tell us what are the misconceptions <laughs> well there, there are a number of misconceptions um i think one of it is brands generally think influencer marketing is a top of the funnel of strategy which it is right but it's more than that um influencer marketing is not just for awareness it's not just to push the brand out there and to let people know uh, what you're trying to do or your budget products it's also you can also leverage influencer marketing down the funnel you can leverage you can leverage influencer marketing in um acquiring new customers in driving sales and purchases um and and that's why it's always important for brands to be sure of what they are trying to do what are your objectives right before you um take advantage of influencer marketing or even reach out to any influencer per se right so it's not just a top of the funnel strategy you can also leverage influencer marketing down the funnel to drive acquisitions even if it's to get people to download your new reports influencers can help with that you can leverage influencers to drive sales and we've seen that happen many times right so a lot of CPG D2C brands 
uh, leverage influencers to drive direct sales of their products and you know of their product. So it's not just for awareness. That's the main point of this. Influencer marketing is not just for awareness. You can leverage it in order you know, to achieve other goals, other marketing goals and objectives. Um, another right. another um, myth, I should say, is brands or many or people generally think influencer marketing is like they 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 treat influencer marketing the way they treat Facebook ads, right? Um, the the main currency of influencer marketing is trust and authenticity. Right? You cannot treat it the way you run. Uh, like an art platform like Meta Ads, that's not what it is. It's human to human connection, right? It's 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 not just somewhere you place ads uh, like Google Ads or something. No, this requires you building relationships with influencers. It requires bringing influencers in to really understand what your brand is about, and it's like you onboarding a new team member. That's the way brands should onboard influencers. Don't just do a one-off project with them. Bring them in, let them become part of your team, work with them, get to know them. You know, it's that's one of the best ways to really get the best out of influencer marketing. It's not just um, one of projects and all that. It has to be a long-term relationship. And right. you don't have to wait till you need them before you start building relationships with influencers. You start even before you need to work with the influencers. Right. Some influencers already talk about many products, even though they don't partner with the brands. Now, there's really no better person to partner with that an influencer that already knows your product, knows your brand, uh, or even is, to make it even better, is already a customer of your, of, your, of your company. Those are some of the best people, some of the best advocates for your brand. So to summarize your answer, it should be long-term, the relationship uh, between yeah. a creator and a brand. Yeah. Uh, it should be human, uh, human to human interaction. It should not sound or feel like an ad. And uh, it can also drive, uh, you know, result at the bottom of the funnel, like yes, downloads yes. on the reports or your yeah. GoFu content that you're doing. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, now, speaking more about influencers, they come in all shapes and sizes. How can yeah. brands cut through the, you know, noise and find the right influencer to partner with? Because as you said, it's very important to build a long-term relationship. And if yeah. you're not getting to the right person, let's say, that would, you know, derail your entire strategy. So with specific audience and goals in mind, how do you find the right influence? Well, we, we need to start from, or the brand needs to start from the, from defining who they are. Like, what's your brand? You know, what, what, what do you stand for? What are your brand ideals? Uh, because it's like trying to start a relationship with, with a romantic relationship. You don't just go out and, and look for anybody. You need to understand who you are and then, based on the information you have, decide, oh, this is the right kind of person for me, right? So it's about compatibility. Um, and you can't be compatible with it, with an influencer or someone else if you don't understand who you are. So brands need to be sure to, or to be clear on what their brand represents. Companies need to be sure what their brand represents and what they stand for, your brand ideals, because that would help you determine if there's an alignment between your brand and the influencer you, or the kinds of influencers that you work with. Right? So that's one. The other thing is you need to have, you need to be clear what are what your objectives are. What are your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? Because then you can, based on that information, you can then decide that based on what we want to achieve, this is the right influencer to help us achieve that. Because in the end, influencer marketing is about you trying to reach an audience and leveraging someone, an individual in most cases, who has built trust with that audience. Right. So one, you need to know what your brand is about. Two, you need to have an objective. Then that can give you um, can serve as a can, can, can serve as a as a guidepost for you to then go out and say, okay, these are the kind of influencers that align with our brand. These are the kind of influencers that can help us achieve what we want to achieve. Now, you once you have once you are clear on that, you can then begin to ask yourself where or who rather do we want to talk to and where do they already hang out. Now, in addition to that, you need to ask who do they listen to? Who do they trust? Who has built a community where we can find these people? If you're clear on those, on, on if, if you're able to define that clearly. You can then it's going to make it easier for you to find the right influencers because essentially you're looking for somebody who has built the right kind of audience, who has built a community, who has built trust. 
with you know the audience you're trying to connect with. Once you're able, to, once you're clear on all these you know different criteria, you can then begin to explore different platforms. For example, if you are trying to reach Gen Zs, we know some of the best. We know two of the best platforms for Gen Zs. You know, social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram, right? If you're trying to, if you're a B two B brand, LinkedIn is ex- it's, it's, it's extremely important for you. If you're a B two B brand, you need to be on LinkedIn. And there are thought leaders on LinkedIn, there are influencers on LinkedIn who can help you reach the right target audience, right? So once you're clear on some of these things that I mentioned, you're, it's, you're, you've solved 50% of the problem of influencer discovery. And in addition to using social media platforms, you can also explore uh, some influencer marketing platforms. I, I'm not sure if I'm, able, if I, if I'm allowed to you know, give specific names. Well, there are different influencer yeah. marketing platforms out there where yep. you can pay a fee and you can access different influencer profiles on 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 TikTok, for example. TikTok is not paid, but TikTok lets you. There's a TikTok TikTok has a creator marketplace where you can register as a brand, and based on different criteria, the location, the number of followers, the engagement, different the niche, you can find the right influencers you want to work with. So it's about being clear on who you are as a brand, what your objectives are. Who are your target audience? Where do they hang out? Who already speaks to this target audience? If you're in B2B also, you don't, you might not even need to be on, you might not need to leverage say, in TikTok. You might need newsletters. Newsletter is very effective for B2B. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially about, you know, it's a combination of different factors that helps you determine or find the best influencers for yourself or, you know, for your brand. And once you find the influencers, you also need to do the due diligence of getting to know them. Um, do your search. Uh, if there are any reference tracks, if there are any case studies, what have they done? You know, you need to do your search because, again, like I said, it is very important that you protect your brand even while working with influencers. You need to be sure that the influencer you're trying to work with is not one that whose activities could negatively impact your brand or rub off on your brand. Right. And that's a great point, Bengab that you said, like, you need to know the influencers you're going to work with because they're yeah. not machines. They're human beings. Yeah. And beyond the data, you have to know what kind of people they are and what kind of things that they are aligned with. So that's mm-hmm. a great point for mm-hmm. the brand managers who, I, who, who might be listening to this right now. Now, moving across to affiliate programs, which have been around mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah. How do you yeah. see affiliate strategy for brands in today's, uh, you know, landscape of influencer marketing changing or evolving? Uh, I, 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 one thing I've noticed is most of, I'll say many of the brands um, leveraging affiliate marketing now incorporate or integrate influencers into the overall strategy, right? Affiliate marketing 10, 15 years ago used to be uh, focusing, used to focus mainly on individuals who you have, have some audience or can run out to your affiliate um, offer. You know, but, but these days you find many brands who integrate from the onset influencers into their um, affiliate market. And I think that's, that's a brilliant move, uh, especially because influencers and creators, um, they don't just have the power to create content or know how to create great content which means they can better sell your products in a way that is not salesy, but they also have the audience that you're trying to look for, right? So if I were to advise a brand today, I would advise them to always have influencers as their main focus, influencers in their niche or in related niches that serve their market um, as the as the main focus for their um, affiliate marketing or affiliate strategy, right? Because those guys are they are already there. They can help you get better con- better conversions um, on your offer because they already they already have an audience that trusts them. Um, and influencers, maybe not all of them, but many quite a number of influencers um, also like to protect their brand and the trust they have with uh with with their audience so you would find that many influencers will not promote products that they are not entirely sure about yeah. or sure, you know that they cannot trust right so those are the kind of influencers you want to work with because that trust to them is very important and it is important to you as a brand so yes that's that's something i've noticed that's something i i encourage many brands to do if you're trying to leverage um 
affiliate marketing, it's 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 almost it's almost impossible for you to not consider influencers, especially micro influencers who have built close knit yeah. communities. Yeah, and I also think like with creator data, you can you know take a deeper dive into you know the performance of a particular campaign. Yeah. So I think we are going to see a you know upgraded version of affiliate marketing. Mm-hmm. We are going to see much more attribution coming to it. So I, I guess it's a it's a shift because of influencer marketing tools out there. Yeah. So yeah. That's one. And now speaking of creator led brands. Which is a very fascinating, uh, you know, yeah, uh, phenomenon. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this trend, and uh, what does the future hold for these types of brands like Prime? We are seeing like Mr. Beast chocolates. I'm forgetting the name. Sorry, uh, things like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 a good thing um, for the creators. It's a good thing for their fans. Um, I think we'll see more of that. We already have many of those brands. Um, many of those creator-led brands or influencer-led brands, whether they are celebrities or content filters or you know regular YouTube influencers or YouTubers, uh, we're going to see more of that. That's that's something that any and it, and it, and it, it makes a lot of sense because influencers or creators are also looking for ways to diversify their income. They're looking for ways to not re- rely entirely on platform payouts. So yeah, YouTuber, you you. you been able to grow your audience to say a million, which is which is a lot. You don't need that many yeah. people for it to actually create a product that make a profit. But if you have been able to do that, you don't want to rely on YouTube um, YouTube payments, YouTube access alone. You also need to look for ways to diversify your income outside of YouTube, outside of whatever each of these platforms pay you. So I think that's one of the major reasons why we we'll continue to have more creator-led brands um, because in the end, business is about selling to an audience. Now, if you are the typical route most businesses take is you create a product and then go find the audience to sell it to. Um, but for creators, they've already found, they've already built an audience, they've built a community and all they need to do is to do proper research to, to ask what exactly do you guys want? What can I do? What can I uh, offer to you what you know, what would you pay for right and if you have already built up that audience you've solved one half of the problem of distributing the products to the market so there's really nothing stopping you other than coming up with the right product for your audience and then selling it to them now that's not to say that every product every creator-led product will succeed we've seen a few um if you have you know have different issues I know there are some legal issues because again, in, in the process of creating these brands, creators have to partner with some other uh, people, companies yeah. uh, to bring these products to life. So we've seen a few hiccups here and there, missteps here and there, but that's normal in the business world, right? But in in conclusion, we're going to see more of these creator-led brands, and I think that should maybe worry some brands because creators are coming into your space. Uh, for example, Messi just released his own uh, product similar to Prime. I can't remember the name now, right? So, and, and again, that's not to say to succeed, right? Yeah. But it starts in a, a better chance of succeeding. And that is threatening to brands who don't have the advantage of a known brand, of, you know, who don't have the advantage of a recognizable brand would have the advantage of having millions of fans and followers all over the world. Uh, yep. So that's something that should worry some brands. But again, the good thing about that is you might not be Lionel Messi, you might not be KSI uh, or Prime, but you can also partner with other creators and influencers to put, to give, to bring that advantage to your brand. I call it the creator advantage, where you can leverage creators, can leverage the advantage they bring to help your brand yep. grow. So you don't need to be a Lionel Messi to yeah. also take advantage of that. You can also, you can partner with a creator to create a product yeah. together. We've seen brands partner with influencers and celebs to do drops. You know, you can you can bring them in as an advisory council to advise you on how to reach the target audience, right? Which is something I think more brands should be doing. You should be consulting with creators where you're trying to reach a specific audience beyond the regular influencer marketing campaigns. So it's, it's, it's not... It's not um, entirely. Um, it's not. It's, it's not even bad news for brands because the creators are there that I can partner with. But it's just something they should consider that as more yep. creators come into the market, 
there is a tendency for you to lose out in some areas. But the good thing is you can also partner with other creators. And if we think, and the truth is many creators will create products. More creators will create products of their own and try to leverage the trust, the audience that they build. So it's, it's just something that I think will continue. And we don't, I, just, I don't see that abating anytime soon. Yeah, definitely. And it reminds me of Nike launching Air Jordan with, uh, you know, yeah, specifically my, for a player, right? Yes. It was yes. sort of influencer marketing back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they yeah. could see those, the potential those, in Michael Jordan. Exactly. Those are the first influencers, you know. It's, it's, and again, that's why influencer marketing is not entirely new. What, what is new is the social that's media aspect of it. The social media aspect of it is what is relatively new. But influencer marketing, um, looking at popular top voices in the market to let you know leveraging top voices in any industry is not yeah. entirely new. It's the social media and go digitalization of it that is relatively new. Yeah. Right. So that's, it's, that's it's, a good point. Yeah, yeah. It, it's something that's going to continue. We're going to have more creator-led brands, um, uh, and maybe what I call creator-assisted brands as well. So you are not a creator, uh, but you can partner with a creator to start a company. I'm trying to remember one now. Uh, Sayo, Sayo Bloom partnered with um, someone, I can't remember his name, but I think he was in the corporate world and then they partnered to start a business to a, a series of business, a number of businesses actually together and, and I think it's doing well. So we're going to see more of that happening um, and it, it just yeah. makes sense. I, I, don't, I don't see why not. Yeah, and you know, that's a great point. Like uh, people or brands who may be skeptical of getting into influencer marketing, they should see it's just like basics of marketing applied to social media because yeah. Michael Jordan did not have 400 or 500 million followers like Ronaldo back in the yes. day. But yes. as a brand manager, you could see the potential in the player. Yes, player. yes, right. yes, yes, it's yes. Very, uh, it's very fundamentally. He, 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 he has always, he has, you know, he had that connection. He had that, um, yeah. he had that uh, following. He had that share of mind, right? He had the name, Correct. you know. So it's, it's uh, like I said, social media has sort of catapulted it, but that's the, the essential trust, the essential connection that comes with these sort of relationships have always been there and brands have always leveraged it. So what is happening now is there's now the social media angle to it. There's now the digital aspect to it. And it has sort of created many Michael Jordans in that sense, right? Because there are more people today with a with number with huge following. There's no, there's no, um, they are not gatekeepers as such when we used yeah. to have traditional media. Anybody can start their own media company today. Just get a phone, a smartphone, and have internet. And, you, and, and you know, you, you're, you're good as, uh, as a media company, which is one of the reasons why many brands need to leverage and work with creators and become creators themselves, right? Um, I think some of the best advocates for any brand are those within the company, like the founder or the CEO and the employees. In fact, I think it's a sin if you are a founder today and you are not pushing your brand, uh, whether you may not be comfortable in front of camera. I don't do videos just yet, but I post on LinkedIn uh, because I, 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 have a, I run a B2B company. I post on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I think that's, 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 you can start from LinkedIn. You can start from Twitter. They are text-based. They are heavily reliant on text and you don't need to do videos you can start writing newsletters but thought leadership is essential for every company especially in b2b so yes you can partner with creators you should partner with creators but you should also become creators yourselves i mean the founders and the leaders of these brands and these companies you should become creators yourself yeah definitely a great point for all the founders out there now speaking of founders you work yeah. with startups at founder institute uh, with an emphasis on growth strategies, how important yeah. is influencer marketing or the creator economy for brands looking to scale nowadays? Because it's fundamental to every startup scaling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's it's. I, I, so I met at um, at Father Institute, um, and specifically in the area of go to market, where you know growth strategy and all that. And one one advice i give to brands or to startups is to which i which i already mentioned one the founders need to start talking about the problem they're trying to solve the solutions they're trying to they've created or why their solution is important why they're trying to solve this problem what are the challenges uh they're going through um and 
that's on one end. So founders need to become creators themselves, right? To drive share of mind, to drive awareness for your brand. And it's not just to your customers, even to your investors, to your potential investors as well. They need to know how you think. If they, if they can buy into your stories, it's easier for you to convince them to also invest in the company, right? So that, that there's that part. There's also the part of working with creators. Now, you don't need to spend a million dollars uh, out of your uh, seed, seed round to work with the creator. You can always find niche micro-influencers who are willing to, you know, who, who already talk about something close or related to your brand and who are willing to also jump on board. Some of them, you can hire them as full-time employees. Some, you can collaborate with them on a project basis, but the relationship is very important. So it is important these days to tell stories. Storytelling is important to startups, right? Because if I'm being honest, and I've said it, I, I don't think technology is a strong moat today. I don't think software or the features is the strongest of the modes we have. I, I think beyond the technology, everybody, every feature can be replicated today. One of the things that is not as easy to replicate is building an audience, building a community of trusted yep. people, of people who trust you, trusted community. It's not easy to build a community. It takes time. It takes time to build your brand. It takes time to build your personal brand. It, it takes a lot of time, right? So you can start now that you're just, you know, especially if you're an early-stage startup, you can start a uh, startup founder. You can start now to build that community, to, you know, build that trust with people. That would help you down the line. It will help you now. It will help you down the line, right? And then, again, partner with creators, partner with experts, partner with, you know, newsletter writers, people in, you know, who share, who, who, who are in your niche, your industry or related niches and industries. Just, you know, get on podcasts, right? Talk about, you know, share your solution, talk about the problem, just get out there, talk about what you're trying to do, what you have achieved. It's it's not... um. I, I don't advise startup founders, especially in this age, to to not talk about what they are building. You cannot afford to not leverage storytelling, you know, for the, for your company. Yep. You need to start doing that. You don't have millions of budgets, or millions, you know, of, of dollars for your market as well, you know, in your in, in your accounts. You don't have the marketing budget of the big companies. But what you have is you have a phone, you have internet. You can start leveraging that. Build an audience on LinkedIn. Talk about talk about your product. Talk about the solution you have on Twitter. Just get out there, partner with other people, so that you can get in front of the audience as well. Right, that yep. will help you not just to attract customers; it will help you to attract investors, and very importantly, to help you attract employees as well. Because then people already know the kind of person they are working with. They can already, you know, they, they can already make some judgments and conclusions. It's, it's a form of employer branding as well when you can easily identify you know, the face behind the brand. I can connect yep. it and then be sure, okay, and then, you know, make certain judgments based on that. So it's very important that startup founders leverage the creator marketing, the creator economy as a whole and, and just get involved as a creator themselves and by working with other creators. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, in a way, influencer marketing is humanizing the entire startup ecosystem. You're hmm. not, you know, like grumpy old men sitting behind, you know, <laughs> work yeah. computers. Yeah. Yeah. Be human. You have to be vulnerable. You have to yeah, be yeah. willing be, yeah. to put your work in front of everyone. Absolutely. Because again, you know, it's it's in the end, whether you're B two C, B two B, whatever you call it, D two C, C P G, whatever you call it, people buy from people. Exactly. Human beings sell to other human beings. So if yep. I, I know there's a lot of be, you know tagging and yeah, in the end, the person who makes the decision to buy on behalf of that big corporation is a human being like you right and that's why people yep. need to connect with other people online and offline so it's 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 not people don't buy from brands from faceless brands they don't buy from you know brands that really don't mean anything to you they don't want to people yep. don't even want to hear from brands right but it's easier for them to buy when they can connect their face to it and all that so whether regardless of what your company you know how you categorize your company you sell to other human beings so it's important that you also you know, connect with them in different ways. Let people be able right. to identify a face, you know, 
connect a face to a particular brand, humanize that brand. Let's not just, and, and that would also reflect in the way, in your storytelling as well, in the way you post content, in how you craft your content. You shouldn't just be mindless, boring, AI-generated content. It has to show the human part of it. It has to reflect that there's a human behind this and all that. Right. Bega, coming to a latest development uh, regarding TikTok. So TikTok yeah. is coming up with a very, uh, let's say, a US-centric uh, version, which is, they're saying, is going to be separate <coughs> from ByteDance, which is yeah. in China. Uh, it's much more political thing. Uh, but looking from the creator's perspective, how do you think it will impact the reach and engagement of creators? I mean, the doomsday scenario, as some of them are painting it as, like even Colin and Samir, in in a you know latest uh, episode, they said that TikTok is is going away in a month. So is it going away? What's going to happen there? What do you think? Well, I frankly, I I based on so I've not really seen an official statement from TikTok about um, trying to decouple uh, the US US TikTok from um, from from the China TikTok. Yeah. from the main tic, from the China TikTok, but. Yeah. Based on information out there, that's essentially what they're trying to do. It's more it's more of a split code, code base. They're trying to separate the code base uh for the US from the from China. But I don't think that's something people we need to worry about. I don't think that is going to reduce engagement or all these other metrics on TikTok. I think the real issue we should be worried about, especially if you're a TikTok user in the US, is the possibility of TikTok getting banned. Because if TikTok gets banned, it's going to affect millions. TikTok has 173 million, yeah, 108, you know, 173 million users in the U.S. alone. Tick, and there are many SMEs, many companies, many businesses, founders who use TikTok yeah. to drive sales, to drive awareness, to drive purchase, and all that. So billions it's, of it's, dollars are at stake. Yeah. yeah. So so there's so there's a lot of money that will be lost by the American public, by the American business community and creators as well. So I don't think the problem here, or what we should worry about, is the code splits. They can split the code. I don't think that would change anything. I don't think it reduces the engagement or your reach. No. The thing you should worry about as a creator in the US is if TikTok gets banned, what happens? We know Instagram is, the, is still the biggest influencer marketing platform, but TikTok is, is essential. Is 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 essential, right? There's I think one of the things that make TikTok easy, that makes TikTok a no a, a no-brainer for most creators is the reach. The reach you yep. get on TikTok dwarfs what you get on Instagram. In fact, other platforms are trying to implement yep. that or to change the algorithm or whatever so that you know, they can catch up with TikTok. It's 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 bad news for creators if TikTok in the US gets banned. Unfortunately, if the US government decides to you know ban it, uh, perhaps because TikTok has refused to you know do some of the things that access to the which is essentially to prepare to sell it to something. And from what I've gathered, from you know information available to the public, I don't see TikTok selling yeah. the US component. I, it's 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 I, they've said it. The CEO has said it. It's highly unlikely that they would want to sell TikTok to the US. And that for me is is, is saddening. Uh, whether they sell it, uh, uh, no, no. Whether no, it's saddening if eventually because of this impasse between the both of them. Um, the, the app gets banned in the US. I think it's going to be a huge loss to create us. It's going to be a huge loss to businesses as well. So I think that's what we should worry about, right? Even if you don't live in the US, it, it's, it's, they, 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 you should worry about people getting banned in the US. They can do, they can split the code base, which is fine. I don't think that's an issue uh, because essentially they are, what they are, what, from what I understand, now I'm not a technical person, but from what I understand, it's basically duplicating the code base, separating the US from the China, right? Yep. Just to give the US government, you know, more assurances, just to make them feel okay, well, you know, data and all the issues they've mentioned are being taken care of. But I don't think that's the main issue. The main issue here is that regardless of what TikTok does, if TikTok does not do, say, for example, sell the US part, the US you know, part of the company to um, to a U.S. buyer, it's going to get banned. And that is what creators, especially in the U.S., millions of them, that's what millions of yep. business in the U.S. would care about. 
That's the real issue. Yep. And it bothers even those who don't live in the U.S. It should bother everybody, especially in the Western world um, where U.S. has a lot of sway. And policies in the U.S. can also somewhat, you know, be for others. Yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, you know, can, can also, in a way, influence policies in other markets in the West. That's that's something I think they should we should all worry about, you know. So Yeah, definitely yeah. because TikTok is the main driver of creator economy. And yeah. US is the main driver of creator economy for the world. Absol- absolutely. So we hope for the best and I think yeah. uh, as uh, Benga said that once the code split happens, uh, the reach and engagement of creators will not be affected. So no need to worry about that. But no, now don't, don't looking at this. it now, looking at it from, you know, the other side, uh, what expectations would the agencies and brands have from this new algorithm or let's say in this doomsday, doomsday scenario? Would that be a, you know, setback for influencer marketing? Or- Absolutely. Yes. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's a huge blow to the industry. Um, not just to the creators, but yeah, to the to the managers, uh, to to the influencer marketing agencies, to the to the platforms too, right? Because again, many of the platforms we use need to pull data directly from source, right? Yeah. So many of the tracking platforms need to pull data from source. Many of the discovery platforms need to pull data from source. What's the implication of that for many of those platforms who are reliant on the first party data that um, TikTok supplies to them? It means many of them will be automatically cut off. Uh, they can no longer offer that service. If your business is entirely built around TikTok, it is essentially dead, right? So yeah. TikTok agencies should be scared right now. They should be afraid. TikTok creators should be scared. Um, so it's going to have a lasting impact on the industry. On, on the, on the industry. Uh, it's going to affect you know, the right. industry in ways that I, I may not even be able to put into words right now because, yes, there's going to be the monetary uh, side to it. But again, it's not just people, many people on TikTok don't just do it for money. It's an outlet for many people. I think it needs to have an emotional toll on many people as well. So right. it goes beyond money. Yeah. So it's it's something I think it's worrying to me. And I know it should worry agency owners, platform owners that rely on TikTok, um, and maybe even the American public as well. If TikTok gets banned, which one is next? That's true. Now, uh, speaking of not relying on just one platform, uh, looking ahead, do you see a single platform dominating influencer marketing or will a multi-platform approach be essential for success for creators in, uh, specifically? Let, let's let's it's, take the example of Mr. Beast. You see, yeah. he, he, he became the biggest YouTube uh, yeah. creator, like yeah. I guess last week, right? Uh, going past T-Series. Yes. Do you think it's a good strategy for Mr. Beast to just stay on YouTube as the biggest creator? Because he's certainly not as uh, as big on Instagram or as big yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so this is how I see it. I, I think when you're starting out, it makes some sense. It makes it's good to um, stay on one platform. But if you truly want to succeed as a creator, it is suicidal to stay on a single platform. Mr. Beast has had to also expand to other platforms. I think he started posting on Twitter and all that. Yes, he's the biggest YouTuber, but it is not wise to keep all his eggs, put all his eggs in one basket. Now, Mr. Beast is huge, he's big. It's highly unlikely that TikTok, uh, YouTube will just pull off, pull down his account. It's not. I don't see that happening unless he does something really terrible. I don't see that happening. Now, but let's talk about creators who are not as big as Mr. Beast. Let's talk about the five the creators with five thousand followers, with a million followers, with even ten million followers. It is, it is, it makes no business sense one to stay on one platform. It is okay to start with one platform and then you diversify from there. And there, and my main reason for that is one, you don't want to be held to ransom by a single platform. You need to diversify your audience across the different platforms. So. In, Build on Instagram, build on YouTube, build on TikTok. If you can, build on LinkedIn. We've seen, I've seen, you know, creators do that. Build on whatever platforms exist, wherever you can find your target audience. Build on that. But beyond building on those platforms, you also need to understand that even if you have a billion followers on TikTok or you have a billion follow, billion subscribers on YouTube, you are building on a rented land. 
right? It's like building your house on the, on the piece of land that does not belong to you. Now, what that means is that you are the mercy of the landowner. So the day TikTok tricks the algorithm, the day Instagram tricks it, many years ago, Facebook pages, you met, yeah, Facebook pages used to be, you know, the in thing until they tricked it and then it, it's dead. It's literally dead right now, right? Now, that's one of the issues with relying on a single platform. So you need to build across different platforms. But beyond that, even if you build across all these different platforms, you don't own them, which is why I always advise creators to build an email list or a community on a platform you own. Essentially, what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to access the information of your fans and followers. Right. On TikTok, you cannot access the information of your fans and followers. You don't have their emails, you don't have their phone number, nothing. You have no data on TikTok or Instagram or any of these platforms, which is why every creator must have an email list. All of them, even if you post cut videos, everybody needs to build an email list. So you need to figure out how you want to build that email list that you want to, you need to see Instagram, TikTok, or social media platforms as a discovery platform. That's what they are. They are discovery platforms. But the real platform where you build your relationship, where you nurture your relationship with your followers should be the one you own. The one they cannot just take away from you. The one a ban by the US uh, um, um, Congress cannot affect. And that's an email list. So every creator needs to build an email list. You can do build it by giving away something for free to your fans. Find a way, find something your fans want, something valuable enough for them to want to give you their emails and their names and their phone numbers so that you can relate with them directly. You can send emails to them anytime. You can nurture that relationship in those emails. You can do your product research within your email or your community. And when it's time, you can start sending directly to you know your, your, your fans or followers. Even for businesses, your email list is an essential asset. It's a very important asset to show up. Now, for you as a creator, you are a business. You need to see yourself as a business as well. So how do you access your followers and your fans if TikTok pulls down your account today or if YouTube pulls down your account today? You need to start thinking about that. So yes, a multi-platform approach is right. But there's an in addition to that, you also need to build on a platform you own. And that is your email list. It's, it's, it's extremely important. Your email list is very important. So you just need to convert a certain percentage of your followers to your email subscribers. And that and you're good. And you keep growing that account, that email list. You keep building that relationship with them. And when it's time for you to start your own creator-led business, you already have an asset that you can leverage for that. Wonderful. A lot of takeaways for creators. Uh, brands who are uh, looking to get into influencer marketing, startups that are looking to scale. It was a wonderful conversation, Benga. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you uh, very much. Again. Clearly, you're, you're the kind of guest we want to bring to our audience. So please, uh, if mm -hmm. you want to nominate someone, someone who's as knowledgeable as you for the next episode, we'd be really grateful to you. Yeah. Uh... Do I have to do that now? I can always send you a few names. Um, but yeah, if I'm if I were to nominate someone, I think um, uh, you can take your time. Yeah, uh, let, let let me let me try to get a name. That I'm I'm not very good with the we, names. We try to put our guests, you know, in a situation like this because we don't <laughs> uh, we want to see them vulnerable on the show here. Because... <laughs> yeah, uh, there's there's uh, there's one. Um, yeah, I think was was okay. Yeah, you you should invite uh, JT Barnett. Yeah, you should you should invite JT Barnett. Yes. Thank you so much. And yeah. uh, to our audience, if you have any questions, uh, uh, if I didn't ask any question that you wanted to, uh, you know, you wanted answers for, please DM uh, Benga. We are going to put his, all his socials in the description of this video. Reach out to him on any platform. Uh, connect with him on LinkedIn if you're a creator or you're trying to replicate how to do it on LinkedIn. Uh, and yes, please let us know what did you think of the show? Uh, what did you think of our discussions? And if you have anything to add, please add in the comment section. And if you want Benga again on the show, which I absolutely want, uh, <laughs> please let us know. Thank you so All much right. for watching. All right. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. 
Filo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Filo, visit getphilo.com. That's get p h y l l o dot com. Also, make sure to search for Influencer Marketing Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Filo, thank you so much for listening. 